Ladies and gentlemen, over the next couple of minutes, I will take you through the story of the FCU. Uh, but I'll start by sharing with you a few facts about Uganda, and uh, that's where the FCU is domiciled. Uganda is a land-linked country of about 241,000 square meters. Uh, of land. We are part of the East African community and also COMESA. The country liberalized in the late 1980s and we have a stable macroeconomic environment uh, where we believe in the private sector as the key engine of development for the future. Uh, economic growth averaging about 5%. Uh, this year focus is between 5 to 6%. There is strong capital inflows, uh, over $1.2 billion last year. And there is a mass concentration of uh, potential minerals, which, which are yet to be extracted. Uh, we have oil and gas, over 3.5 billion barrels are already proven, a lot of tourist attractions, and strong comparative advantage in agriculture, which we need to transform into competitive advantage. Overview of the banking sector in Uganda, there are 25 commercial banks, three microfinance institutions, uh, MDIs, and several thousands of circles. The commercial banks and MDIs are regulated by the central bank. But what's interesting to note is the opportunity. Only 54% of the adult population have access to financial services. And of these, the banking sector is only contributing 23%. The rest are mainly those who are using the mobile money, especially for mobile money transfer. So that shows the strong potential in this economy to be able to grow the financial services. And that also shows the problem which we have that so many of the adult population is still unbanked. There is also a shortage of long-term funding and that's why the likes of no fund uh, a blessing to, to us because they think long term, so we are able to intermediate and provide the much needed long term financing which is required for economic development. Uh, a couple of themes shaping the banking sector in Uganda. Financial inclusion, as I said, is, is really one of the key things we need to look at because there is a lot of financial literacy to be done. There are so many people have money, but they prefer to keep it in their mattresses because of fear of the banks and not understanding that money can work for them. So there's quite a lot of work to be done in trying to educate the public to use the banks, but also to increase our outreach as financial institutions. Because one of the challenges is that you may find that the next bank is 200 kilometers away. So it's not viable for, for these people to go and bank their small savings and accessing the money would take you probably a whole day to go and withdraw it from the bank. The demographics are a blessing for us, uh, a very young population uh, with uh, approximately 60% of the population below the age of 22, which means that if we can get this population to go to school and they're educated, there is quite a lot of demographic dividends to be uh, enjoyed in the next decade as, as this population matures. So it's, it's very interesting times. The next decade will be very interesting once this population is now part of the working population and they are no longer dependents. There is the digital revolution. Right now we are seeing a convergence of the mobile, mobile money and banking services and the banks are actively trying to collaborate. Our friend from Telenov talked about that they are not a threat to us, but the banks actually believe that they could be a threat. If, if we don't collaborate with them, they could actually transform into banks. So we are actively working to try and uh, collaborate with the telcos, and uh, at, at the FCU, we are working on a project of trying to integrate our systems with the two major telcos in the market so that we are able to do what they call the push and pull. So potentially, once the loan agency banking is passed, any of their outlets could actually become an outlet of the bank 
because all you require is to go there and you can deposit money to be reflected on your bank account or you can go and withdraw cash anytime. And this will ease on the access to financial services at a more convenient cost as compared to the traditional brick and mortar, which is very expensive. The regulators are quite focused and uh, there's a lot of tightening of the duty framework, especially given what happened in the 2008 economic crisis in the Western world. So our regulators have learned from the mistakes and they're quite uh, strong. Agency banking, as I said, will be the key to transforming banking in, in Uganda. Once the law is passed, we expect any time, then we should be able to have thousands or tens of thousands of these small agencies of the mobile money becoming agents of the bank. And that will change the whole game and ensure that we achieve our goal of inclusive banking. DFCU, uh, just briefly, DFCU, uh, our, our vision is to provide a broad range of quality products, and uh, we pride ourselves of having so many products in the bank, and also we are focused on our SME segment. Our mission is to grow shareholder value while, tra while playing a key role in transforming the economy. We strongly believe that it's only when you have a sustainable operation that you can be able to add value to the economy in which you operate. So as Deepak said, it's not just about uh, supporting development, but we have to do it sustainably. So we also aim to make sure that our shareholders are also adequately compensated for the risks that they have taken. DFCU was started in 1964 initially by CDC, DGIFC, and the government of Uganda. But we have evolved over time. In the 1970s, during Amin's time, we literally closed down for 10 years with only two clerical staff because it was not uh, tenable to be a business at that time. But in the 19, 1990s, the, the company diversified uh, into leasing, property development, mortgage financing, because the original uh, mission was purely to provide development financing and equity, which was quite limiting. And it was very difficult to build a sustainable institution on a very narrow base. Uh, in 2000, we acquired uh, a commercial bank and we ventured into banking. So we are now about 14 years in commercial banking. Uh, we are listed on the stock exchange in 2004. That's when no fund acquired 10% uh, stake uh, the first time. And uh, recently, last year, they increased their stake to 27.5%. And then all the other businesses that we had were integrated into the bank to create a one-stop shop. So as we speak right now, we have three key shareholders. Uh, no fund, 27.5%, rubber development. These are now the technical banking <coughs> partners who are giving us support. And CDC scaled down to 15% with over 4,000 shareholders on the stock exchange. In that picture, that's the time when no fund were increasing their stake last year and the Minister of Finance was handing over the certificate. We do have a corporate governance structure, but I will let that pass together with uh, a couple of departments which support the business growth. The key main uh, departments are mainly the, what we call the DIB. DIB is Development and Institutional Banking, which combines our development arm as well as the corporate business and trade finance. We do have uh, the Treasury Department and the Consumer Banking, which is the retail arm uh, where we manage all the delivery channels. Uh, just a quick glance, with 50 years in business, $550 million in total assets, we have over 300,000 customers. The number is now 350,000 customers because we were blessed last month with uh, a small bank which was under liquidation by the central bank and it was handed over to us to manage, so we managed to get another 60,000 new customers. We've uh, managed to build our own head office, we mainly concentrate on retail and SME. Uh, Deepak showed 34 branches. They are now 48 because we acquired some more branches uh, as a result of the, that small bank which was passed on to us by the central bank. And we hope to close there with 48 branches. We offer mobile and internet banking solutions. We have over 800 staff, of which 49% are female. And as I said earlier, we believe we are a one-stop shop. 
Our funding is from various sources because we have to intermediate. And as I said earlier on, uh, there is a shortage of long-term funding because of the low level of savings. So what we do, or what we've been doing traditionally is we work very closely with the international financial institutions, no fund uh, being top on the list. They provide us with equity, but also with uh, debt. And their debt is both in shillings as well as um, in forex, foreign currency. And the demand is mainly for shillings, which most of the other lenders find difficult to, to raise. But no fund is able to hedge and provide us with the much needed shillings, which we use for home loans and for lending to the SMEs long term. European Investment Bank, FW, DG, IFC, FMO, Propaco, these are common names. We work with them. We've been working with them for the last 50 years, strong partners, and we are able to complement the deposits which you see on the other side to be able to continue our mission of providing long-term funding. In this market, we have a number of products uh, which are listed there. We do have the home loans, business growth loans, uh, in, in our retail offering. We also have a women in business program because we recognize that women are a strong force. Uh, apart from just looking after the families, uh, we believe that the women entrepreneurs need support. So we have a special program for the women entrepreneurs where they access financing on a preferential window in terms of interest rates, but also in terms of the conditions, especially as they don't have collateral to be able to secure these loans. In the corporate, we do offer term finance. These are long-term lending up to eight, 10 years. Uh, commercial mortgages, uh, we do leasing, asset financing, which again is very critical in our environment because for SMEs that don't have security, the asset itself then is able to work as security and they're able to access the funding they need to expand their businesses. And uh, trade finance, and of recent, we are scaling up our activities in the agribusiness because of our relationship with Rabobank, who have done this successfully for a long time. So they are helping us to build an agribusiness unit at DFCU. And obviously, Treasury uh, is one of the key services that we offer. The focus sectors are several, uh, agribusiness, uh, education, manufacturing. Uh, these are all sectors where we are actively involved, and uh, we finance tens of thousands of businesses over the last 50 years to be able to support the development process. Again, trade and commerce, that's the entry level for most SMEs. It is the easiest way to enter into business. And then eventually they start looking at the value chain, either backwards or vertical integration happens. Transport, again, is another key area where we've impacted using our leasing business. We've leased so many buses, so many trucks, as, as you noticed, Uganda is a land-linked country, so we need to move the goods from the coast to inland. And so transport is a problem, especially where the rail network is dilapidated and we have to rely on the road transport. Real estate, again, is key. Uh, infrastructure development, again, supporting those businesses that are in the construction, being able to open up the roads. That is one of the roads being opened up in the rural areas, a feeder road. And then oil and gas is a new economy that we believe is going to transform the country. And uh, in this respect, we actually support the SMEs that are providing the local content. We, we are not lending to the big boys, but we are supporting the SMEs that provide services to the industry. Obviously, there are challenges in, in our business. High cost of funds, as I mentioned, we are look, we're relying on external debt, by and large, 40% of our funding is from these IFIs, and obviously you have to pay the price uh, to be able to get this money because you have to compete for the funds. High cost of operation because we are still small, but we believe that once we get the mobile money, we can scale up and be able to reduce the cost. Skills gap, we have to continuously train our people because the industry is relatively new. And external challenges, again, uh, regional stability, Southern Sudan is one of our key trading partners and of recent they've had issues and this affects our business. Infrastructure is a challenge to get the goods from the rural areas into the markets. And of course what happens this side, the uncertainty in the Eurozone crisis 
in the last three years obviously also affected us in terms of inflation and uh, exchange rate volatility. But th these are challenges that we work with and are able to navigate around them. Opportunities for growth. There is immense potential for growth uh, in Uganda, and we believe that uh, the financial services industry will be able to reap some of these benefits. As I said, oil and gas is one of the emerging economies, requires massive investment. So we believe that uh, we can support the SMEs who are supporting the under the local content component, who are supporting the growth of this business, agribusiness potential, a lot of comparative advantage, which we must convert into competitive advantage, manufacturing industries, especially those for import substitution, the population demographics, again, it's a big potential because urbanization must happen. That means that we must commercialize agriculture, but at the same time, we have to provide the infrastructure for urbanization. R right now, we're talking of 15% urbanization in Uganda, and this will have to grow to as high as 60%. So you need the houses, the residences, you need the infrastructure. And again, this is an opportunity for us. Infrastructure, the rail, energy, again, there's quite massive potential. ICT, we are seeing the revolution. So many uh, people now have access to mobile phones, and this is going to change the way business is done. Financial inclusion is something that we have to look at. And regional integration, uh, right now, the, the five East African countries are trying to put together a monetary union, and that will mean that we can get more efficiencies and do business across the borders. Our focus, given all these opportunities, is to build a robust retail operation with multiple distribution channels, and we target to have 1.2 million customers by the end of 2018. Uh, it's a big task for us, but it's possible, especially if we get the HNC banking model going, and if we're able to collaborate and integrate our system with the telcos who are offering mobile money services. So we should be able to have the mobile money, I mean the uh, mobile banking, internet banking, and then the agency banking and the brick and mortar as a mix of our channels that we are building right now. Uh, we want to continue lending to the SMEs using our long-term products, the development finance. So we will have to consolidate that. Right now it accounts for 75%. With the retail growth, possibly it will go down to 50%, but it's still a strong growth area. And also, we want to be the leading bank for agribusiness. We've recently set up an agribusiness unit. We've recruited over 20 agronomists who are being trained. We are looking at the value chain of the various crops and sectors that we want to participate in agriculture. So we believe, again, we can play a critical role in helping the farmers to move from subsistence to commercial farming. And in pursuit of financial inclusion, because this is one of our cardinal objectives, is definitely to build a retail distribution network to reach out to as many people as possible at an efficient cost. We need to continue providing the long-term funding for the SMEs to grow and realize their ambitions. We have to enhance our risk management processes, internal and the internal capacity to manage the growth that we are looking for. We are moving to a new head office, uh, which also will help us to uh, consolidate our activities and enhance efficiency. We are collaborating with the mobile operators. And recently, we launched a project which we call the Quantum Leap, which is helping us to review the way we do our business, business process reengineering. We are looking at the internal capacity, make sure that we upskill the team. Uh, we are looking at new products and segmenting make sure that we have the right products for the right market segment and obviously also understanding the value chain in agriculture because agriculture is inherently a risky business. We must understand it and be able to put our money where we feel it is safe. And in doing all this, as I said earlier, we've been able to make profits consistently for the last 10 years and declare a dividend to our shareholders. So our investors, no finance, can rest assured that we'll continue to make sure that we build a sustainable operation and ensure that there is an adequate return. Uh, over the last three year, 10 years, we've averaged about 30% return on equity, and we believe that this is still possible. So thank you very much.